100% for being here. I've been trying to drag her to come talk for quite a while. So I was really happy, um, even though it's it's during uh, COVID and we can't all be together for the drinks afterwards and some of the fun. But Felicia, and I'm not making this up, Robin, we could take a note that when we are back, I think we should do the second half of the excellent lecture and at least do the reception at some point um, and kind of go from there. But um, I want to thank Robin um, also for organizing these and for all the students here to uh, realize that Robin's here for you guys. If there's certain speakers or certain workshops or certain things you want to learn outside of what we're currently doing, feel free to bug her. <laughs> I'm saying sending it all to her um, in that way. So Felicia, welcome. Um, I was saying at the very beginning that I remember Felicia from class in 2015 um, and bugging her about whether or not she remembers me and how it's always so nice to have a student come back after a certain set of years out in the world, um, doing journalism, engaging with all sorts of things, and then come back and take over basically for a little while, um, explaining your experiences. So the way this is gonna work is we're just gonna hand it to Felicia. Um, she's gonna introduce herself beyond what we just said and run questions and go from there. And I'm gonna, gonna sit back and um, be quiet. Welcome Felicia, I'm gonna give you a little clap though. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, Robin. And David, I'm definitely going to take you up on that reception card because the drinks, it's for sure. I'm like, I'm in 100%. So I'll definitely take you up on that offer. Victoria can only <laughs> afford water, unfortunately. Like <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so bring your own uh, wine. <laughs> um, so, um, so hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join uh, us today. I'm uh, a little bummed that we couldn't do this in person. But I mean, I'm super, I've gotten super used to doing things on Zoom and Skype lately. I, a lot of the stories that we've been doing for global and all the media have been uh, taking place virtually like this. So this is kind of our new normal for now, I guess. Um, so I'm hoping to speak a little bit and then really have some sort of conversation afterwards. Um, so please keep questions uh, that you may have, uh, think about them, any comments, and feel free to uh, get them ready for uh, right after I'm done a little bit of a spiel. So here we go. Um, so first, I just want to start uh, by saying how flattered and really honored that I am to be speaking to you all today. I graduated from the DIP program um, over just over five years ago. So um, it hasn't been too, too long, but it really feels like just yesterday that I was walking up and down the hallways and stressed about deadlines and exams like you guys are, papers, presentations. Um, and luckily and miraculously, I, I got an internship at Global Montreal just a few months after graduation. And I've been there ever since, really. They haven't uh, been able to get rid of me. Um, so, and even though it's been been five years now that I've been with Global, I still feel like a, a rookie. I, I really work with some of the best in the business. And I know everyone says that, but I feel like that. And uh, I really learn new things every day. So I remember when I spoke to my news director about being asked to give this talk tonight. First, she, you know, she was pleased to hear that I chose this local news topic because it's really the heart and soul of what we do at Global Montreal, finding original community stories that no one else is telling or talking about. Um, that's really our motto. And uh, she also told me that it would be, you know, nice because of the fact that I'm a relatively young journalist to talk to younger students and journalists about why they should get into this profession and why news is so important. Um, obviously, you know, that's a big task, but what I'm gonna do today is speak about the kind of jur journalism that I do and explain why having the knowledge of uh, what's going on in, or in and around your community is a powerful way to be involved in um, society today. Um, and hopefully that may inspire or encourage uh, some of you to want to continue um, pursuing this profession um, after you're done your studies. So first, I'll just tell you all a little bit about myself. I was born and raised here in Montreal. I grew up on the West Island. Um, I realized uh, in high school that I wanted to be a journalist. I took um, an elective called journalism. Uh, going into the class, I had no idea what that was. Um, and then I figured it out uh, with the help of that teacher that I still you know, really keep in contact with today, which is nice. And um, you know, I, I really fell in love with the craft. I realized I was good at telling stories, but not so much fictional stories, more so real stories that matter to people and, you know, made a real difference. When it came time to um, apply for college, I went to 
creative arts program at John Abbott. John Abbott. Uh, then I went to um, Concordia for um, an undergrad in English specialization. Um, and then I, near the end of that, I thought, okay, what am I going to do next? I thought maybe an English teacher, uh, but I realized it wasn't my passion. Uh, it was something, it was something that I was good at, but not something that I was really loved. Um, so then uh, when it came time for my last semester, I remember speaking to family and my now husband who uh, had told me, do what you love. So um, the DIP program came into, uh, into uh, my vision uh, by browsing stuff on Concordia's website. And I went back to that and thankfully I applied, I got in and you know, that program was only three semesters, but I mean, I can't say how much I loved it. I wish it was almost longer. I, I really got, it taught me so much, uh, hands-on training, uh, and it opened a lot of doors for me as well. Uh, I, I got an internship at CBC, uh, TSN 690, uh, and then what came next was uh, my job at Global. So an old friend of mine actually uh, approached me when I was graduating and said, oh, I know this person that works at Global, and I'll give you their email address. I'm going to ask my father for it. I said, okay, no problem. Um, I waited, and eventually he got back to me with Jamie Orchard's email address. And I said, oh, you, you know, you know, Jamie, like, you don't know just anyone. And he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so anyways, after emailing her and Karen McDonald, uh, Global News's um, news director, maybe... I don't know, a million times they got sick of me and finally let me let me in the door uh, for a one month internship. Um, and uh, three weeks in, they said they needed someone to do a story because they were short on uh, short staff vacations and so on. And uh, they threw me in the fire. Uh, and fortunately, I didn't get burned. Uh, that's how I kind of remember it. And, uh, you know, I was so nervous. Um, and I didn't know what I was doing. But I just kept telling myself, you know, fake it till you make it. And that's what I did. And I feel like that's how I really got through <laughs> the rest until I kind of got the rhythm of it. I just kind of kept going. And, um, you know, I, I say it all the time when uh, what, every story that we do, especially at Global Montreal, we don't have, you know, the sports section and the politics section and the court section. We all have, we have to be experts on every subject. Um, and every day I, I become an expert in something almost um, and, uh, and try to, my best to explain it to the public. Um, so two years of freelancing at Global turned into a full-time position in November, 2017. I got a full-time job there at, at Global um, as a photojournalist, which is basically writing, shooting, editing my own stuff. Um, and uh, essentially uh, not too long after that, I accepted a position, uh, we turned that position into an iPhone uh, reporter position. So I became Global's first iPhone reporter. Um, so I do everything with an iPhone, a tripod, and a few other compact accessories. Um, it all started off really as an experiment, but then once we uh, realized it worked pretty well, we kept it going. And eventually Global started to actually integrate more of these iPhone kits in stations across the country, which was really cool. Uh, people in New Brunswick, for example, uh, started up with the iPhone kits and then they would reach out to me to ask questions about equipment and so on. Um, so it was really nice to have, you know, this newfound knowledge and share it with my colleagues in other parts of the country. And for us at Global Montreal to be the first to uh, really do this, uh, the first global uh, station to do it um, in the country. So uh, it's it's been working pretty well. I'm still doing it three years later. Uh, but you know, the thing about the iPhone is you can't do everything with it. Obviously, the quality isn't as refined as our massive $30,000, $40,000 cameras. Uh, but and you can't film every story with it either. Things like big press conferences uh, with the premier or scrums with uh, politicians where you see lots of reporters. Events like that are tough to do with the iPhone, but what it's allowed me to do is find a niche, which was really our goal um, in introducing the iPhone. I remember sitting down with uh, Karen, my news director, and she had told me, you know, this will give you the power to be maybe our, our community reporter. And uh, I, I wasn't sure at first how it would turn out, and and but fortunately it's turned out really great and it's allowed me to focus on the kind of journalism that I love and appreciate and 
I'm here talking to you about today, which is small stories. Um, so obviously I don't mean small in the literal sense, by small I mean local, a community oriented story, something that's happening in your own backyard. As the expression goes, it can be an issue that's affecting an individual or a community or maybe a group of people. Um, like local news in its literal sense um, is, you know, local traffic or weather or maybe a fire that's happened at the apartment complex, you know, two blocks from where you live. But local news is, you know, it's all that, but it's also news stories that can change and shape the course of people's lives. And sometimes they can even spark national change. Now in recent years with the increase of social media and technology, we as a population, we consume news differently. And in turns at times, local community news has taken a back seat. Um, you know, uh, as a young journalist, I know by speaking to some of my peers and acquaintances, sometimes friends, many can't name their local mayor or they're unaware of the flood that may have devastated, you know, their neighborhood florist or some don't even know who the premier is. But knowing this information, being aware and understanding what's going on in your own backyard, it's really vital. And these small stories, they do a lot. They hold your municipal, provincial, and sometimes even federal politicians accountable. They dive deep into local school districts and they investigate the neighborhood handyman, you know, that may have been ripping off your neighbors. They talk to interesting people in the area that may be doing something remarkable that you never even knew about. And they just provide color to the neighborhoods around you. So, but to speak to, you know, no, local news and, it, and its importance, one also has to mention its challenges. The six o'clock news hour was appointment television for, you know, most households, even mine. I remember growing up and my dad used to be in front of the TV at six o'clock sharp. Uh, you know, no one could talk in the room. Uh, you couldn't talk to him either. Um, and, you know, I, I remember growing up like that. Yeah, because the local news was on, so no one could speak. And he still does that today, you know, many do. But in the last couple of years, you know, less and less people are doing what my father does. There are now dozens of ways that people can consume the news. And because of that, local news stations across the country are having to think about creative ways to cut costs and still provide communities with the news they need. Now, unfortunately, layoffs are a difficult reality of our business. This year's pandemic has made uh, this even more challenging. Um, they're a devastating blow to you know, any news organization, especially during these strange times. But what you'll find in every local news station, uh, I think, and uh, in, in ours anyways, is a group of people who are really fighting to provide the news because they know it's important people who believe in providing a service to their community, a service that they can see that will make a difference in people's lives. And now more than ever, I think local journalism is proving its worth. It's, it's during, as we navigate this pandemic, um, people are depending on local news stations to know how to stay safe. They look to the news to find out what you know, COVID-19 measures are being put in place for their region or how to apply for government programs to keep their businesses and families even afloat. And they also look to us to bring attention to an issue that they may be having. Uh, COVID-19 has obviously been an incomprehensible time for everyone. People are being banned from seeing family, friends, people are losing jobs. You know, we've been confined on and off to our homes. Um, and many of these instances require people to know information, especially information that's going on, you know, around them in their community. Um, now, there are tons and tons of stories that I've done uh, amid the pandemic that, and my colleagues have done, especially that have proved how crucial local news is. The list of examples, they're really endless. I actually ended my maternity leave in April and came back to work right in the middle of the pandemic in April. So right in the beginning of the first wave. And it was really when things in uh, long-term care homes started to uh, blow up. And I remember my first week back, the Heron in Dorval uh, was all over the headlines. Residents there were dying from COVID-19 and the media really started to dig. Uh, journalists uh, discovered how horrendous the conditions were there and other facilities. And one story that I did in particular that really hit home for me was when we started to hear rumors about bad conditions at a long-term care home in Dollard on the West Island. 
I was going through posts on Facebook, literally just reading the comments that people were leaving on different news articles and came across a woman who had spoken about the conditions at Vigi in DDO. And uh, she had mentioned that the, the conditions were starting to deteriorate there. And I ended up connecting with her and she had told me that her mom lived there, was uh, in her mid nineties, had Alzheimer's um, and, uh, and she, because she couldn't pick up the phone and communicate with her directly, the staff had to be the ones to call. Uh, but that was starting to, to, to diminish in um, recent um, weeks. Um, so according to her, um, her mother was doing well, uh, no sign of the virus, uh, but was, she was getting worried. Uh, so we started making some calls. I actually went over there, I got some visuals. Now, from the outside, things looked completely normal, but from the inside, a whole different story was really playing out. I remember that day, I couldn't get anyone to speak on camera, uh, so we held the story. And that weekend, my colleague, Dan Spector, followed up and found out that a few dozen residents were diagnosed with COVID. Uh, he, we continued on the story. And on the Monday when I was back at work, I spoke to that woman again, and she had told me that she got a call from the home saying her mom had a light fever and a cough. And she was now also willing to go on camera about the way the communication was going and so on. So we interviewed her and another woman. Uh, we got a story together. Um, and um, there was just over a dozen or so COVID cases at the time. Um, and I remember uh, the next day that that woman messaged me again saying her mom had now tested positive for COVID-19. Um, so we were discovering that there was something going on in the facility. Um, and then the next day, TVA uh, picked up the story um, and they said, you know, a doctor had went to the residence um, and noticed there was no one on staff for the 160 residents that were there. Um, and at that point, 89 of whom had tested positive for COVID-19, so over half the, the residents. Um, and then when I called the woman that morning to check in on, on her mom, she told me that she had passed away the night before. So I was really heartbroken. I mean, keep in mind, I speak to people all the time that lose loved ones, that loved ones have gone missing, their loved ones have gone missing, their loved ones are ill. But for some reason, this one had really hit me, I think maybe because I had gone through the journey with her where her mom was okay to uh, sick and then suddenly dying over the span of just a few days. And um, I feel like maybe also Global had something to do with, we had something to do, my colleague and I, with finding out that you know this facility was having some issues with PPE and staffing. Um, and even though we didn't know what was going on at first, we really didn't let the story go. And we pushed until we uncovered what was what was happening. So after speaking with the woman, uh, journalists from Global and other media started calling the owners, uh, making calls to the CIS, uh, the Regional Health Authority, trying to figure out what was going wrong at the residence. And so when the media got involved, things really started to improve. Um, extra staff were being brought in from other residences, hospitals, the CIS, PPE was being distributed. Um, staff were calling families again, you know, once again, to update them um, on their on their loved ones. Um, and um, then they would update us and they would say, you know, okay, we're getting we're getting updates now, things are going well. Uh, so things started to stabilize. And I feel like it just goes to show how the local media was really able to advocate for these families to be their voice, to draw attention to the situation. And though it was, you know, too late for that woman who lost her mother and for 70 or so others um, who unfortunately passed at the Vigi um, in DDO, it hopefully helped for the dozens of other residents who still live there today and for their families. Um, so, the, like I said, I mean, there's the, the list of COVID-19 stories, especially, uh, is endless of how media and local reporters could really intervene and uh, try to help a situation. Um, so, staying in this past year, um, when I say a small story can spark change on a larger uh, scale, another story that I was recently part of comes to mind. Um, a few weeks ago, a Laval woman 
um, she took her eight-year-old autistic son to their local indigo store. Um, she said uh, the pandemic, like for a lot of people, had left her feeling cooped up. Um, her son is being homeschooled and obviously there's not much that he can do outside the home since many activities have been canceled. So she said that her son loves indigo. He loves choosing uh, his own book and toy. Um, and he, they used to do it all the time pre-pandemic. So she thought to take him there one day. Um, so keep in, uh, So she went in um, with her son and her son wasn't wearing a mask. She was stopped at the door um, and said, you're not allowed to enter uh, the store. Um, now keep in mind, according to Quebec's uh, mask regulations, uh, uh, children under the age of 10 aren't required to wear a mask and those with disabilities at any age aren't re re required to wear a mask either. Uh, so she was pretty upset. Uh, she knew these were the rules in the province and she explained that uh, to the store employee and manager and was told that at all Indigo stores um, in Quebec or, across, or I think even nationally, the rule was that anyone over the age of two needs to wear a mask. And if you can't, then curbside pickup is available. So she was uh, very upset. She left um, the store um, and she ended up uh, reaching out to some in, so to Indigo on social media and there she received the same response. Um, so she had posted about what happened to her on Facebook. Keep in mind, we keep, we, we take a lot of stories from social, we get a lot of our stories from social media of people go to social media a lot um, to, say their experiences to their peers and to different groups. So that's where we got this woman's story. Um, and my assignment editor had reached out to her and uh, she agreed to, she was hesitant, but when she agreed to speak to us, she said, you know, I don't want to sue Indigo. I don't want anything like that. Uh, I'll speak to you guys, but um, really I'm speaking to you because my son is on the spectrum. He can't speak for himself. He can't express, you know, his feelings and um, his frustrations. And, you know, there's many others that can't do that either. So I'll speak on behalf of him, basically. Um, so later that day, I had spoken with a lawyer and the Ministry of Health and Social Services, who told me that uh, the business technically could create its own rules when it came to people uh, being on their property. Um, and though government, uh, the Quebec regulations are recommended, they can't be forced in a private business. So of course I reached out to Indigo as well. I told them about the story. And right before the end of the day, as I was uh, editing, I got an email back from a spokesperson saying that after hearing this woman's story, Indigo would be changing its policy across the province to align with Quebec's rules. So that now meant that anyone with disabilities that couldn't wear a mask could now go to the store and uh, children under the age of 10 weren't required either to wear a mask. So, you know, when I spoke to her uh, about it and I had told her that this was happening, she was obviously ecstatic. I mean, she didn't really think that speaking out would make some sort of difference. Um, and, you know, this woman and her son's story is really a perfect example of a small story that ended up making a change on a bigger scale, in this case, on a provincial level, um, that will, you know, in turn affect a lot of people. Uh, essentially, we took her experience and gave it a platform, brought her story directly to the company through channels that she on her own may not have been able to access um, and, you know, really made a change. So that is really what I think my team and I aim for. I mean, with most stories that we do like this, uh, these kinds of small stories, and it's what drives local media, I think, and it's what makes it really powerful. Um, so staying on the topic of maybe creating change for a group of people, um, I, another example, staying off of COVID, because I feel like it's a lot of COVID. So <laughs> off of COVID, um, I remember back in November 2018, um, we were sent an email about um, a uh, press conference that was taking place um, with a few families with children who have a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. 
uh, parents were hoping for some social media, some media to show up um, in order to get uh, the provincial government's attention uh, to call on them to approve a new drug called Spinraza. Um, now, the drug had been a approved um, in dozens of other countries across the world and was shown to slow down the symptoms of SMA. So Quebec at that point had yet to approve the drug. Uh, they were apparently studying it and it was taking a little while. Um, so at the press conference that day, there was a lot of pleading, a lot of tears. And I knew when I got there and when I was listening to these people speak, I, I knew it it was a topic that needed attention. Um, and I was sent there that day to do a, a VO SOT. So I'm sure most of you know that what that is, but just in case, so what we call VO SOT is a 45 second spot in, in the show that involves the anchor on cam speaking uh, with visuals and usually one clip of about 10 to 20 seconds of uh, an interview. Um, so when I got there and I listened to what and heard what was going on, I, I called the station immediately and I said, uh, look, this is what I have, this is what the story is about, and then I think the story needs more attention. So I got the go-ahead, and uh, I remember that day I did a two-minute and 30-second story on on this uh, on this drug and that parents and children were calling for uh, to get approved, and two minutes and 30 seconds is a lot on, on TV. Uh, it's You don't get that kind of, kind of time often. So I, I remember that day I got a hold of um, Quebec's health minister, the rep for the health minister, I bugged him quite a bit uh, or a lot. Um, and by the end of the day, uh, I ended up getting an answer that uh, there was a study being done on the drug um, and that uh, when the results were pu published, hopefully by the end of the year, they had said uh, that they would make their decision on whether or not to approve it. So obviously more waiting isn't what, you know, those families wanted to hear or something that I wanted to hear. As a journalist, though, your job is to be fair, neutral, you know, unbiased. Your heart definitely goes out to families like those who struggle, uh, those who are need, need of help, those who are, you know, pleading for something to, uh, especially when it involves children, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes. So uh, it, waiting is tough. So uh, we, I waited, the families waited, and once December came along, we put in another call to the health minister. Uh, I wanted them to know that I didn't forget what they had told me um, about their statement, um, and I didn't hear back. Um, but f a few weeks later, uh, one, it was an, uh, late in the afternoon, close to Christmas, I was on another story, um, and one of the parents who was at the press conference that day called me and said, Quebec had approved the drug. Um, and I remember running to my managing editor and my news director telling them the news. Uh, it was very exciting. I, we dropped everything. Uh, we got a camera to go to the parents' house um, with, the, with the boy. Uh, there was tears, uh, but, you know, obviously this time happy tears. So, um, you know, I wasn't the only one on the story. Uh, there was other journalists from other media, local media, a few different French and English. Uh, but to be part of it was really satisfying. The fact that you have the ability to speak to people, you give them a voice, hassle the politicians or the people in charge, and then hold them accountable, make them keep their word, you know, even put pressure on them uh, to help bring change in, in people's lives. And knowing that I could, you know, even in the smallest way, help um, change the course of their lives, it's really motivating. So, you know, two years have passed since then. The drug was taken by this boy. He's still getting it. Um, I, I, I still keep in touch and he's gotten a few doses. He's doing well. And as I understand, he's just one of hundreds of SMA patients um, in the province that uh, are, can now benefit from this drug. So uh, this story really touched, you know, a whole group of people. And it really made a difference and a change in all of their lives. So that was a really, uh, really great, satisfying story and uh, ending. And not always happen. It doesn't always happen in the same day, I guess. It, you, sometimes, you know, that was spanned over about two months. Um, so uh, I have another example. So one more example of a story that I did. 
uh, that was part of that kind of affected a whole group of people. It was during the floods that had taken place in 2017. Um, and I'm sure every journalist working those floods uh, will have a few stories to, to tell you that you know touched them. Uh, but for myself, uh, there was a handful. Uh, one in particular though, uh, one, one of the places that was hit pretty bad by the floods was um, a borough, uh, the borough of Pierre Hon Rocks borough. Uh, while covering the floods, I was actually living at home, uh, at my parents' home, uh, and where I lived since the age of three, so for about 25 years. Um, my parents don't live by the water, so their home wasn't affected. Uh, but just a few streets away, there was hundreds of homes that were pretty much underwater. Uh, I would literally drive a minute or two from, from, from home to find houses halfway in the Rivière des Prairies. So it was really insane to, to see it all like that and so close to home. Um, so it was maybe a week or two into the flooding when someone reached out to me via social media to ask for help. They, they messaged, I think it was on Twitter, um, and they said their street in Roxborough was five to 10 feet underwater. Um, and the borough of Pierrefonds uh, wasn't there. They weren't helping in any way. Um, so I remember it was early in the morning. My shift was starting at 9.30. So I was on the train on my way to work. So I forwarded the message to my morning reporter, uh, to our morning reporter, my colleague. I asked him to go check out the street. Um, not too long later, he called me to say, a few dozen of the homes on the street were completely underwater um, and there was no one there to help from the borough, no firefighters, no police. Um, and he was the only person there basically and just doing interviews with people, talking to people, figuring out what was going on. Um, and so then he started tweeting about it and so on. And then as this shift came to an end in an early morning, I ended up going, taking over. And at that point, other media members started showing up as well. And by the time noon rolled around, several reporters were doing lives from um, this location um, in, in Roxborough. And um, at this point, there was about 20 homes on the street. Um, and at its worst point, at the end of the street, uh, 10 plus feet underwater. Um, com completely, some completely destroyed. Um, so uh, all the residents were out in the in in the beginning of the street where there's less water, speaking to reporters. Uh, we were doing interviews, and they were really fuming. According to them, water from the river, uh, which is nearby, flooded their street because of a leaking dike that uh, was. Um, broken and they had continuously asked the borough to fix in the past even before the flood had started uh, but was never fixed. Um, so up until that point we were all there reporting from the street um, and finally one citizen who was really fired up he approached me um, and he told me that he went to a local command center he told officials that he needed help uh, he said there was a dike that needed to be fixed uh, water was pouring in um, from that location and someone needed to stop it. Uh, and apparently he was told that the, because the dike was on AMT property, because there was a train right nearby, that they couldn't do anything about it. Um, so basically he couldn't comprehend, you know, in, a, in this time of crisis that uh, no one could go put a few sandbags on a dike to stop the water from just, you know, rising. Um, so a few hours later, as all the media is there, firefighters, police, and borough officials start to arrive. Uh, there were tons of cameras, um, and everyone's talking, standing around, and this fired up citizen comes back with a pickup truck. He gets out of the truck and starts unloading a bunch of sandbags. And then he, we're all filming him, and he says, he tells, not like, uh, pokes on a, on a fireman's uh, uh, back and says, I'm going to go and take all these uh, sandbags to the dike myself in this canoe, and I'm going to stop the, the water from coming in. Well, he wasn't allowed to do that because it wasn't his property. So police arrested him um, on the scene <laughs> and people were shocked. I mean, the neighbors were shocked. Media member, the neighbors were yelling and media members, we really couldn't believe what was going on. This, this man's house was probably halfway under the water and they were arresting him uh, for literally trying to save his street. Um, now, when you live in a community that you're documenting, it becomes a little tricky because 
it's you know that much more meaningful because you really feel for for these people and it kind of affects you as well um you know we're not robots we can be objective but uh we feel it when you know something is maybe um you know our neighbors are being flooded uh, you feel you feel for them you feel for them if they're being treated unfairly or or whatever the case is so the citizen ended up going to jail for a few nights uh, he had to go to court a few times, um, and we followed the story until the end. He was released. The dike ended up being fixed. I even visited him as he began his rebuilding process, uh, the demolition and uh, and construction. It was a long journey. So when I sit back and think about it, it's pretty crazy that that morning a street was sinking, literally underwater. Residents were reaching out to members of the media for help because the borough hadn't been listening. And then by the end of the day, this story was the top story in the lineup for French and English media all of a sudden. Um, and you better believe by the end of the day, public officials were aware of the of the street and they were listening. Um, so I, you know, I think that's something that I hear a lot from citizens. They'll call us and they'll say, you know, we know that with your platform, public officials will will listen. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they need a few more follow-ups. Uh, but I think that's what we, what we really try to do. I mean, someone's suffering, if community members are in need uh, of a voice, we try our best to literally give them the microphone and let them tell the story. So I couldn't go on, you know, as you could see, I, I, there's a few examples, dozens and dozens of them actually, that stand out for me in my short career. Um, and what I think all of them have in common is that there's some kind of situation or experience that was affecting a person, multiple people or a group, um, and that they need help and would like to see some sort of change. And I feel like um, as local journalists, we're here to give them that platform, that voice, um, be their direct line to these private corporations, businesses, or public officials the big people, you know, that are not on the ground with the general public or seeing what they're seeing or experiencing what they're experiencing. Essentially, our role is kind of the middleman. Uh, that's how I see my role in it all anyways. And, and the end goal is to make these small stories big. Now, for any students or aspiring journalists or really anyone who loves the craft and is part of it, I think the main reason why we all want to be involved in some way in this field is to tell a story, whatever that, may, that story may be, a, a big story, a small story. What I think is crucial is for these stories to really mean something, even if it's not directly changing someone's life, it can be impacting it, it can make someone think about something differently or think about something that they hadn't you know thought of at all before it's funny when i was doing the diploma program at concordia i really thought that i wanted to become a sports reporter that was my goal really i grew up in a hockey and soccer house i watched a lot uh, i played soccer competitively until i was a young adult so i was always really in touch with sports and i thought oh it would be really cool and interesting to maybe follow uh, a, a team or report uh, like a team like the Habs and report on them or go to the practices, games. And when I started working at Global, I had expressed interest in sports reporting and I was sent to the Bell Center a few times, Brossard Training Complex. Um, I also did an occasional story here and there on the Alouettes or the impact. But as time passed, I began my role as an iPhone reporter really diving deeper into community stories. I realized my passion. I love a good sports story. My team knows that. And I have a lot of respect, of course, for the sports reporters who dedicate their time to following a team. It's it's sometimes very you know grueling hours, long hours, reporting on them, uh, and you know uh, telling feature stories sometimes on these incredible athletes. But for myself, reporting on the community that I grew up in, speaking to the locals, to the business owners, teachers, politicians, sometimes even literally my neighbors you know, to tell their stories um, that can potentially change their lives, uh, the lives of those in my own backyard. And I think that's what's, you know, important for me right now. That's the kind of journalism that is driving me. And I think we need more of them, local reporters, community storytelling, small stories. Uh, we need it so we could fight for the little guy, as they say, so that these small stories are heard or given a platform. Uh, because if we don't stand up for our neighbors, I feel who will really. Um, so 
Um, that's my spiel on local stories <laughs> um, and local journalism. Um, anybody have any thoughts or questions or comments or whatnot about anything that, you know, doesn't have to relate to local stories, but really anything that, uh, you know, maybe the iPhone reporting or maybe how uh, stressed you are about your exams, if you want to chat about that. <laughs> I'm going to let uh, everyone jump in, but I'm going to go first since no one's going for this year, that's okay. And I'm sure Andrea, I always have to bug you to ask a question, but students, you guys should go first as we go in there. So I'm just going to ask a, an easy softball one because I, I kind of have to know um, a little bit, but at the beginning you talked, and I'm looking at my notes because you said so much, I was scrolling stuff all over, but you talked about this idea of coming to journalism and figuring out that you uh, wanted to tell real stories versus fictional stories. And I could hear that in all of the examples you're giving and, um, and one of the reasons I love to watch you on TV too is that like the fire and the, the passion of believing in what you're doing comes through in, in, in like all the stories you tell in that kind of way. And it came through in the classroom um, when you were there as well. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what that real means. Like what was the difference? Like what really separated it? Because often you can see those things blurring and a story is a story, whatever, you might do it in a thousand different ways. But for me, the way you emphasize real, it sounded like there was something more to it um, than just the fact that it was at global or um, for a news organization. Muted still, muted, muted, muted. Do you hear me now? Okay, I had taken out my earphone, but then I guess it didn't connect. Okay, so um, when I had spoken about real stories, I feel it was more back in high school. Uh, it's more because I think we were doing, you know, a lot of creative writing uh, back then. Um, and um, then when we got, when I got into that elective, that journalism elective, it was more like, um, you know, speak to a real person about a, something that they're going through. Um, and, you know, turn it into like a story. So I felt like I wasn't good at making up stories in creative writing class. That wasn't kind of like my, uh, my go-to. I really liked talking to uh, a person about any situation that they, they might have been going through. Just like that, I guess that example that I gave about the woman with her sons and, and, and a real experience. Um, that's something that may have been bugging somebody, something that may not seem right um, and bring it to the forefront uh, so that you know we could create some sort of change or somebody could know about it, people could hear about it because oftentimes you know, there could be hundreds, maybe thousands or whatever of other people that are going through that same situation, right? Um, just like I feel that, that, that story that I told about the, in the, the autistic um, uh, boy. So that's what I mean by, by real. I feel uh, uh, just everyday people, you know, my neighbor. I interviewed actually, I, I moved to a new neighborhood and I was doing a story about local crafters and their, um, their uh, you know, now that Christmas is coming up, markets are being canceled, Christmas markets and local crafters are really uh, struggling to find uh, ways to sell their stuff. And I figured out that uh, a neighbor of mine is a local crafter and I interviewed her and spoke about her struggles. So literally my neighbors speaking to my neighbors sometimes about stories. <laughs> no, fair enough. And tell me, I, I'm gonna let other people jump in. You can raise your hand or you can just um, jump in as we go. Um, and if I see you, I'll go there. And Robin, you can also see those kind of things. But beyond that question, and Andrea, I'm gonna ask you to ask a question because I can see your eyes as you go. I need to know Felicia about the iPhone and about some of what you're saying about not just about the kit and the technology used, we can get to that if the students are interested, but more about when you're saying it works for some stories and doesn't other, um, for other stories and just your like day-to-day -day life uh, around this phone and using it. Because I know many of the students now, we don't, the depot isn't open, all that, that uh, technology is not necessarily available. Everyone's working on their phones, everyone's forced to go mobile, um, but yeah. you took the step well before everyone was stuck with it on some level. But at the same time, you said there were certain spaces, which I could imagine in my own life, although I'm a writer and not as visually 
um, successful as you are, but like just th that kind of sense of there. No, you, I know you have a great eye. So tell me a little bit about the phone and then I'll open it to everyone else. Yeah, so uh, the phone is interesting. So um, first of all, when I first became a photojournalist, we, I was using a smaller camera, um, uh, 20 pounds or so, I would say with the tripod and everything else. Um, but uh, I quickly realized that um, I wasn't able to handle the kit on my own five days a week, um, full time uh, for hours and hours a day. So uh, f first of all, the iPhone really became uh, in integrated in our newsroom through me because of the fact that it was tough for me to handle the, uh, the camera's weight. So for, just to give you some background, uh, that's how it came about. And then, uh, but now uh, when we started, so we knew when we started using it that um, when we go to press conferences, for example, in, okay, pre-pandemic, uh, non-COVID, we would have to plug in certain things uh, in for the audio, you know, to connect to our camera and so on. So these plugins, we don't have yet for the iPhone. So we can't do, I can't go to a, a press conference, let's say with the premier or prime minister and, and record, uh, actually record everything. Yeah, on my phone. So uh, that's why I say stuff like that doesn't work or uh, scrums with, um, you know, 20, 30 uh, other reporters, it becomes difficult as well. Um, so we really focus on, and, and we had known this back in 2017. Uh, so we really knew that we were gonna focus on one-on-ones or small groups or like, um, maybe being a second camera. Sometimes I could have been a second camera at a, at a, at a press conference or yeah, so stuff like that. Because I, right now it's tricky because I'm still obviously with the iPhone, but I, I'm obviously, I'm working from home um, and I do a lot of uh, interviews on Skype now. So things have really changed in the last year, I guess. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues are doing that as well. Uh, but yeah, so the iPhone really works for some stories and doesn't because of the fact that uh, you know, some of the plugins and, and so on. Um, and uh, also there's no ability, we don't have the ability to really zoom properly for all of those who have an iPhone. You, you know that when you're zooming in, you uh, lose a lot of the, 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 the focus and uh, the pixels. So I really have to get close to a person if I want to zoom, uh, which I can't really do that much right now. So, uh, so it, it, it's tricky, but we figured it out. Um, my assignment editor, um, who has been, uh, we actually just got a new assignment editor, but she's, my old one is still in the mix and she knows exactly what works and what doesn't. Uh, so we've kind of worked together in the sense to figure out, okay, this story would be great for an iPhone and this story, okay, maybe we'll, we'll hand it over to a colleague, but sometimes I still get lucky and uh, get sent uh, a colleague so I could see somebody and then we could do we do uh, another story that a bigger story that I may not be able to do uh, like a big press conference or something so uh, yeah I stay lucky because I miss my colleagues uh, very much so I, I can't see them right now. <laughs> no fair enough. Andrea. Thank you can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so, so interesting. Um, oh, good. What I wanted to ask you about was something you, you sort of mentioned in passing a bit was like finding stories on Facebook mm -hmm. um, and on social media. And I wanted to ask you, and you know, especially for the new journalists uh, in the crowd today, like what, what can they be doing now um, in terms of social media to you know, break out of their own bubbles and to start, you know, using social media the way a journalist does to, to look for stories and connect with people? Does that make sense, my question? Definitely. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was actually, I had a performance review two days ago and I actually was talking to this about my assignment editor. We're always talking about social media. So um, I actually downloaded, I think, Twitter when I was in Concordia. So um, not too, too long ago. Um, I, I think that social media is super uh, powerful uh, for journalists. It's a great way to, it's a great tool. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, and we use it a lot to find stories. So 
uh, what we do is I've become a part of many groups on Facebook, for example. Um, I have a, I've learned, I've actually just created a separate page so that I could separate if I want to have a personal Facebook and a, and a journalist one because it, it could sometimes get uh, tricky. Uh, but I'm a part of a bunch of groups and um, really I browse through some of the posts sometimes um, and I look for stories because I'm, I'm, I could tell you, I, I think every you know second or third day a story is found on, on social media uh, and through Facebook. Like, like I had mentioned, people love posting, uh, like posting about their experiences on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, so um, we have a scheduler with uh, all of our story ideas and a lot of them will have links to social media. Um, so I think that for younger journalists now, I mean, I would just, I'm sure a, a lot of them are already a part of groups. Um, they or or maybe not but if you aren't i mean i would join some of the the local uh some local groups i am a mom now but before i was a mom i joined groups like montreal families or west island moms just to kind of see like just to kind of lurk really uh we are me and my assignment editor were joking the other day that we're really uh voyeurs uh we just kind of look around um, and we kind of we kind of just like yeah we my assignment editor does it all the time we uh we look around we see what's out there we see what people are talking about um and then i'll reach out to them uh via social media sometimes people don't want to speak and sometimes they do and uh, like the story about the woman with her autistic son, that was a Facebook story. So, um, and that was an exclusive story to us too. So it was, uh, it's, 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 a great, uh, it's a great way to find stories nowadays, really. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Awesome. Questions from students. Anyone want to jump in? Oh, Rob's got a question too. I'm going to see you, Rob. You, you got to hold one second, Rob. Does anyone want to jump in? That can't let me and Andrea be the only ones to talk. Okay, Robin, you're <laughs> up, but feel free to jump in. Don't let me dominate. Hey, Felicia, great talk. It was really uh, interesting topics, but I was really uh, interested in when you, it seemed like with the examples you gave about your local stories, it sounds like there was a common theme of you staying in contact with the main characters of those stories. And by doing that, it almost gave you more follow-up stories and more possible local story ideas. So I'm just wondering if this is something you would suggest to younger journalists that when you're working on stories to constantly keep in contact with all the people mm -hmm. you may be interviewing for other stories. Definitely, for sure, like uh, 100%. So I have, um, uh, in my phone, I keep everyone's numbers most of the time. Uh, sometimes I have people's names in my phone that I don't even know who they are. I have to click on them and remember, like their, look at their description, uh, but it comes in handy because yes, definitely I follow up. Um, I, I either reach out or they reach out to me. And sometimes even for stories that um, they'll reach out, they'll save my number and then they'll reach out um, for stories that are completely different than the one that we had spoken about, right? Um, so um, when you're out in the field, I would suggest uh, if you meet someone, let's say, uh, example, you're at a long-term care home and you happen to meet um, a loved one um, outside saying hi to their mother or father. Uh, you chat with them, you interview them. At the end of the interview, ask them for their number, like write it down, put it in your phone and keep it because when you're gonna do that story again, you know, in uh, uh, in uh, maybe a couple of months from now, you're gonna want their comment again. You know, um, I remember the other day, uh, the other week, we uh, heard that the Heron in Dorval was closing its doors officially for good, right? And so what we what I did was. Uh, that was breaking around one o'clock. I was working on another story all morning. At one o'clock, I had to shift and have a, a story up for five o'clock on the Heron closing. And I remember we went through uh, my notes. Okay, where are my Heron families? And then, you know, called them up and uh, asked them for comment, right? So uh, it's always good to ask for numbers, ask for contact info and have a, like a Rolodex. Of, uh, of contacts. And then of course, 
you know, your colleagues and, and we always swap numbers and we kind of save them and uh, yeah, and we go from there. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, Felicia. Eric, you're up. I saw your hand. Plus, I've been bugging him on the chat to say something. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're good at putting me on the spot, Dave. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, this was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could give me your thoughts on social media as a broadcasting tool. I'm thinking of like Facebook Live, Instagram TV. I think Twitter has a streaming function. Yeah, for sure. Um, we were actually doing quite a few Facebook Lives uh, before pre-pandemic um, when we were all able to work together. Uh, so now it's been, you know, it's a little, it's been a little difficult, but yeah, no, uh, it's a great tool. Um, I know that some of my colleagues do it often when they're on a breaking story. So a quick way to get information out when you're on location. Um, we'll, sometimes our uh, stations will ask, the station will ask us to go, uh, but we'll do it through um, Global Montreal's Facebook page. So we would have access, we would have to have access to it, or you can do it on your own if you, if you would want, but you know, it depends your day, you know, so um, it, it's funny because I remember sometimes in, uh, in dip, in doing the dip program, we would have a couple of days to do a, a story. Right. And it's completely different in, in, in the real, uh, workforce because you have eight hours, you have an eight hour shift, you know? So, uh, at 9.00 AM you're, you're, you start, you're assigned. And then when you're depending on where the day takes you, uh, you could only, you could be on location and you could only have maybe an hour to gather your stuff. Uh, so you have to do interviews and get your B-roll. And especially if you're a photojournalist and video journalist and you work on your own, sometimes you don't have the time to, uh, do, uh, Facebook lives. Right. So uh, it, it really depends your leeway, depends your day. Uh, and we're, we're constantly, uh, my colleagues and I, prioritizing, OK, what do we what do we need to do first? You know, get the interviews, get some B-roll and then maybe we need to get back because we need to write and edit our own stuff and have it up for five, five of 30 uh, so that our producers are not. Uh, losing their minds at 529 because the story is not in yet. So uh, we, we, we have to prioritize. So sometimes social media gets um, uh, left to the back burner. Uh, I was actually just saying this to my assignment editor. I need to remember to tweet more about my stories throughout the day, uh, but it, it really depends. But I definitely think if you have the time, you're on location, you're on a breaking story, um, I remember covering the mosque shooting um, in Qu Quebec City mosque shooting. Uh, a lots of, uh, you know, things are happening all day long. So you could just do do those lives anytime, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a great tool, I think, for sure. Awesome, thank you, Felicia. So I have a question from Savannah that's uh, in uh, the chat. I don't know if you want to open it up uh, for the show. I'll yes, read it as okay. well. Um, her connection sure. is not perfect, but she's uh, asking, does it ever come with any added challenges finding stories through social media? Um, for example, the factuality of the story becoming questionable, sources falling through more, and, and items like that. And uh, Andrea, you hit on a good topic here in social media and thinking through it. And I know um, for me as well, I wrote down in my notes, this is idea about um, finding stories through social media, social media being not basically the only way you're finding stories. Because I really heard a lot about the local and just walking down your street and finding a story. So I'd love yes. to hear about this. And then maybe you could also add on like the other ways that, that you're, you're really um, locating and finding these important stories um, locally. For sure. So uh, first of all, yes, it's really tricky um, to get a story uh, through social media. It's not um, always uh, super easy. Definitely, first of all, when you reach out to the person, they may not, they may have a great story, but they may not even want to go on the record and talk or, you know, in our case, we're doing, uh, well, I'm a, I'm first a TV reporter. So I'm always looking for on camera interviews uh, first. And some people don't want to go on camera. Uh, but then, yeah, the, the question of factuality, uh, it does come into play uh, sometimes, but um, we always kind of, uh, we do our due diligence, I would say all the time. And um, lots of times, I mean, 
this is where your workshop with Paul Cherry will really come into uh, to play. Uh, but uh, you often, when writing a story about something that is so, you know, a specific experience, well, we often have to, you know, attribute it to that person. So she says this happened and according to them, this, you know, took place. Um, and then, you know, like, like a story again with my, the woman with the autistic uh, son, I mean, this is her experience. Um, and we, we, if it's a story like that, we obviously, we believe them, but we attribute it to them kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, but it, it, it for sure gets tricky. Sometimes we have to um, get other players involved. We search for other people. Um, if we see a story on social media, like something, somebody reached out to me actually today to say that um, there was uh, there's a situation about at Royal West, uh, with um, Royal West Academy, with um, the students, they were allowed to wear sweats because apparently a lot of the windows are being opened lately because of the ventilation issue of COVID. Uh, and now they're not allowed and people are upset. Well, that's only one person. So what we're going to try to do is find, you know, other people that are experiencing this. So um, that's how, and, and that's like social media that was through uh, Facebook as well. Um, so we'll do that. And then, David, what was your um, added on? Oh, now you got me interested in sweatpants. You're the only person that could make me interested in whether or not high school students are wearing sweats. Um, so I'll wait for that one, though. But the other one was to, to broaden it up um, to not just about um, social media, um, but also about the other ways you're finding stories and yes. comparisons in that sense, like walking down the street in those elements. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, we read, I, I read lots of local papers, um, the suburban, uh, which is a paper I actually was writing for at some point. I'll always, I'll, I'll take, I'll always look through the school uh, papers here once in a while. We'll, we'll take a look. We'll take a look. There's a few off island local papers. Um, so these um, small um, online or uh, paper um, newspapers. These are great way to find local stories, um, and also. I mean, uh, unfortunately, for it's it's harder for younger journalists, and I found it was tough too coming into the business. But like a lot of my older colleagues would always find these original stories faster than me. But it's because of their Rolodex that I spoke about before. That when they would go out on the road, they would keep these people's numbers, and they would keep in contact with them, and that's how they would always get their follow ups or get new stories. Um, so the the more experience you have, the more you talk to people just talk to people by, by talking to people, you're going to get, you know, numbers, you're going to build connections. And this is how you could find original stories. And um, uh, I always, you know, just try to keep, um, have great conversations with them and, and keep them, keep myself in their good graces, I should say, so that they would, they'll come to me if, and they could trust me with another story. Um, you know, people, um, multiple, multiple times this will happen more, like I mentioned before, where people will call me with a new story idea. Um, so, uh, like I said, unfortunately for younger journalists, it's a bit tough. You have to really grind at the beginning and, and build that Rolodex. Thank you, Felicia. That's totally awesome. So I know, Gabrielle, you have a, you have a, a question, but I'm going to hold you for a second because I think Valentina, if I have it right, it says it says iPhone, but I'm guessing it's Valentina, had a question in the chat as well. And just, again, building off social networks, because I know there's always a lot of chat about this, but now talking about sharing your own opinion um, on social networks and the tricky business, I think you triggered some people by separating your Facebook pages. Um, so um, whatever, however you want to take this one, I think there's a lot of directions you can go. I think it's a really good question, this idea of do journals have a right to share their own opinion concerning um, important topics on social networks? Yeah, so that's, it's definitely tricky because um, so for us at Global, and I, I'm pretty sure most um, news stations, they, um, we do have like a social media contract where um, you, uh, I, I, I need to be identified even on my personal like uh, uh, platforms um, that I, I do work for uh, a news station. Um, so uh, sharing your own opinions, uh, it's a very um, thin line. 
Um, I would say that uh, I personally keep my opinions off social uh, media. Um, I think that uh, it could be it could be a little bit of a tricky thing. Um, I so I do not do that. So the, 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 the straight answer would be no, um, <laughs> because unfortunately um, you do represent um, a, a a corporation, a bigger you know uh, a, a new station, um, and on a lot of these platforms you are identified as a, as a as a journalist so it could get uh, it could get you in hot water especially f what your what your opinion you're sharing i would say so uh, yes to some things but uh, controversial opinions uh, i would I, I keep them off a uh, social you really handled the hot potato well. I like it. That was great. I love it. Gabrielle, you're up. I know. It's a, there's a lot we could talk about there. And um, <laughs> yeah, I know I hope every student that's here is is um, appreciating. One of the reasons we put these together and Felicia's here is because you should write to Felicia personally. You should have her yes, as one of your contacts. Sure. She's talking about building your context. She's amazing. And these conversations would obviously be different one-on-one -on -one than in this kind of thing. But Gabrielle, you're up. Yes. Hi. Oh, thank Hi. you for, uh, for the lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm teaching a class on digital reporting, so this is really good for me. Uh, I was wondering when you started to be an iPhone reporter, was the perception a bit because, you know, working for a mainstream media, like some older journalists could, you know, tell you that it's not like a pluralistic form of doing oh, yeah. journalism. <laughs> so what... Like, did you have to fight, like, to to you know, to tell uh, other journalists and you know that it was uh, a legit way to do journalism in twenty twenty or how, definitely? How, like, did you? Yeah. Yes. So yes to all of the things you just said. Um, yes to everything. Um, basically, um, when we first started, even the older cameramen that I work with would kind of laugh at the the iPhone um, and didn't really take it that seriously. Um, you know, they, uh, it, it's tough. It's, it, they didn't, you know, I would show up to uh, sometimes uh, stories where other journalists uh, and cameramen were, and they would be like, this is what you're filming with. And still till today, sometimes when I show up to places, um, people are like, oh, wow, you're just going to film that with an iPhone? And I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to film with an iPhone. So when you watch tonight, um, compare the story to the other stories and see if you make it, if you, if you uh, see any difference, really. Because, I mean, the, the iPhones, I mean, the qualities are, they're just getting better and better. Though I did mention, it's not as refined. To the average um, news watcher, you will not see a difference between my story and between uh, a story that my colleague did with a big camera. At the end of the day, people want the news. And so it doesn't really matter how you're going to deliver it to them. Um, uh, well, it does, but I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if it's uh, with an iPhone, uh, that quality, or if it's with a big a uh, huge camera and we've seen it because of the success, I mean, with, with me and with the fact that we've been integrating in uh, more and more kits uh, across the country uh, so uh, and I've seen them also um, at uh, colleagues of at CBC are using them as well and I, I, I think other stations will uh, will kind of go to that as well but yes definitely I had to fight and I'm still fighting <laughs> for the fact that the iPhone is a legit way to film and it's a light way to film. And then I laugh at my colleagues sometimes when they're slugging around and I'm just like hopping around with this little kit, you know? So no, it's, uh, it's definitely like a new way to work. And I think one that is here to stay and that will only evolve uh, my, uh, I have a great team of engineers at Global and they keep updating my, my kit. Um, it used to be that I would uh, plug in with a wire to the iPhone with the microphone and now everything is nice and wireless. I have always new lights, uh, light, little light kits that kind of go onto my tripod. Um, so it's constantly being updated, which is, which is great. And um, every few years 
will hopefully and, and obviously update the iPhones with all these, there are always new ones coming out. So, uh, so yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Felicia. And I'll take my great beard as that question wasn't a reference to me, Gabriella. Um, uh, Maya, I know there's two Mayas in the room, but um, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, yeah, they're both me. Oh, they're both <laughs> you. Even better. Because I'm, no, I'm, I'm like, so, I'm Maya. Go ahead, Maya. Maya. Yeah, sorry. I to my phone as well. I was trying to see which one was better. Um, my question is just, uh, well, thank you so much, first of all. That was fantastic. Uh, a lot of great insight. Uh, the life of a reporter. Um, my question is just more to do with uh, pitches. I'm curious to hear a bit of the process of pitching uh, stories, uh, any experiences you've had, negative experiences would be interesting to hear, uh, you know, what stories have gotten rejected and which, which ones are uh, embraced. So that's a great question. Um, uh, assignment editors love when you pitch. Well, my assignment editor loves it anyways. Um, if you could, because if you can go and make their job a little bit easier by, you know, they're not looking for stories for all these reporters in the morning, um, then for sure, you know, uh, why not? But, you know, it's very uh, casual for us because usually, okay, well, pre-COVID, we're, just to give you a picture, we're all, you know, let's say we start at nine, we're all in the office, we're all huddled in a, in a, in a, in a room and everyone's just throwing ideas out there, basically. Uh, okay, yeah, so I heard that, uh, you know, there's a, a woman that's having a trouble at the CHSLD and her mom wants to go on the record, uh, the, the, the daughter wants to go on the record about it. Okay, great, so who could you get? And we kind of talk it out. Uh, and, and then that process kind of continues throughout the day, uh, obviously, because um, you're, ga you're, news you're gathering from the morning until about early afternoon. Uh, so you're always kind of talking. Uh, but then, I mean, negative pitches, I would have to think about that. I mean, uh, my, like our, our, our team, we really, we really cover everything. Um, so I would say that a lot of the times, if it's something that is turned down, it's maybe like, because it's not for today, maybe you need to think about uh, more about the pe players involved who you'll interview um, and kind of uh, sit on it a little bit longer, come back to me tomorrow with more info uh, kind of thing. Um, I would say that that was, uh, that would be maybe a negative, but one example that comes to mind really, uh, so I'm uh, seven months pregnant guys. I just, I don't know if I didn't, I don't know if I would, if it looks like that, but I have pregnancy brain. So right now, all that's coming to mind is COVID stories. Okay. So, uh, and no COVID stories are rejected. I could tell you that because a lot of, I mean, there's always a story to tell these days. We're, we're super busy. Um, usually sometimes pre pandemic, we're looking for stories from other networks to fill the show and not, not now. I mean, we're always really overloaded on stories. Uh, so everything is really, everything really matters nowadays. Um, but really, I would, all I would say would be that usually assignment editors love the pitches. You just go in, you would say your idea, we would talk it out. And as long as you have something in mind, uh, our assignment team is really open to letting us kind of pursue whatever kind of story we, we would like. It just would depend on the day. Um, maybe we would save it for later that week or, 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 or whatever the, the case is. Thank you, Felicia. Mackenzie, you're up. I was gonna forget to mute myself again. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for being here. It's a really, really interesting conference. I'm really glad I signed up for this. <laughs> Um, I want. I wanted to ask you if you could uh, walk walk us through an entire day of how it is at work. For sure. Um, so, okay, pre -pan pre pandemic it, things are super different now. Would you like to hear a pre pandemic like normal day? Uh, yeah, because I'm figuring okay. right now is a bit more tricky and it's, uh, yeah. it's a, an adaptive uh, job to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I could mention what I do now because we're all in different roles, but I think. A typical day would be pre-pandemic uh, would be more interesting. So, um, first of all, we do have a morning show, um, and then and that morning show, people start at two, three, four a.m. 
Um, and then they finish anywhere between 10, 11 and 12 uh, o'clock noon. So uh, there are, uh, there is that, but, um, and their process is a little different from ours who work for the evening news. So uh, we, I file for the evening news. Um, so I start at nine o'clock. Um, my colleagues and I will go in, we'll have um, a little meeting, like I was saying with Maya uh, to pitch. Uh, we'll talk about stories of the day. Sometimes we, there's no room for feature stories or um, there, there's like, we're maybe three or four or five and the stories are laid out. Uh, okay, you know, there's this big fire, we have to get to that. Or, uh, you know, the premier's talking, we're gonna get to that. So sometimes we're really assigned the stories because the big stories are happening. Um, and then, um, so let's say I'm doing one of my local stories just for the sake of uh, my talk today. So let's say I have a local story lined up and um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make calls. I'm going to book some interviews and I like to always book the interviews in the morning if I can get, get it in so that, cause usually I'm driving to the location. Uh, so um, if I'm working alone, so I would go drive to wherever my interviews are. Sometimes it's a one-stop shop, which is always, a great thing for photojournalists like me, where one-stop shop where the interviews and the B-roll is in one place, uh, but it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes there's two locations, three locations um, for different interviews or visuals. And so we'll drive, we'll get the stuff. We'll always aim to be back at the station, I would say by two, three o'clock, really the latest. Um, and then, so obviously, as you can see or imagine, lunch is really on the go. Your day flies by. Um, and you would get back, you would sit, write, um, get your story uh, vetted, as we call it, uh, edited, um, and uh, then start the edit process and have it sending uh, by five ish. We also write our web script. So we the web part of it, let's say you go onto our website and you see um, our story in web format. Usually it's the reporter that writes it. Sometimes we're lucky enough to have our web producer write it for us. Um, and then we also do a VO SOT version, which I had spoken about before, uh, that will air in the morning show. So we write three versions of our stories. <laughs> yeah, um, in, and, in, and edit them as well. Um, most of the time, that's the process. Just quickly, pandemic, I am a uh, pandemic day in life is I'm working from home. Not all of our, my colleagues are, um, but I am. And I think I'm the only, I'm actually the only photojournalist working from home. So. Um, I'm working from home. I uh, when I wake up, we we do our meeting over um, Slack. It's a on, it's an online platform where we all chat. Uh, so uh, we can, we all throw the ideas out. It's more much more chaotic this way, uh, but it's nice. We kind of just type all of our ideas out uh, into this platform. We chat um, and we get um, uh, assigned that way. Sometimes we we call. Uh, each other, but um, our assignment editor is really busy. They juggle a million things in the morning. So we try to do it that way. And then I call and make uh, all my calls from home. I drive out if need be to do uh, B-roll interviews or I do Skypes. And then the same process is uh, uh, writing and editing from home. I have a work laptop. They set me up with a double monitor, which makes it much easier to edit. Um, and then I send, but I send much earlier from home. So um, I try, if my story is not in by like 10 to five, my, my producer is calling me and uh, is asking me, where is my story? Because it could take more, it could take longer with my internet speed. I remember once I lost power for absolutely no reason, just the whole, um, my whole region lost power and I had to drive to, uh, my mother-in-laws and hook up to their Wi-Fi to send my story. So things are happening like that, um, working from home. But yeah, so that's the a typical day. It's a uh, it's a very hectic day, <laughs> and uh, but it passes very fast. So you don't see the time sometimes go by, which is great. When is your 
time slot to find subjects because in, in in everything you just said it's like pitching and you already have your idea when you come in in the morning <laughs> so a lot of the times okay, because sometimes we'll have like a little bit of a like we log in at 9 a.m. and, you know, we're, we're talking, we're chatting sometimes, you know, hey, whatever. And during that time, we're looking for what's going on. But most of the time I would say it's, you know, off hours. So you're, I'm scrolling through Facebook at night uh, after I put my daughter to sleep. I'm uh, uh, on the weekends. I always have an, uh, an eye or an ear out uh, on social or I'm looking at other, um, I'm looking at the Gazette, I'm looking at the Suburban. Uh, it's kind of just like when you're, I mean, I don't know, the news is always on. When you're in this field, I feel like you're just, you're looking, you really don't take a break. And it's it's something that is very encouraged from our boss. They say, my boss always tells us like, really log off when you're, when you're off, especially now with the pandemic, because it could really take a toll. I mean, you're, it's, you know, the subjects we're talking about, uh, especially, you know, in the beginning of uh, the pandemic, in the first wave, it was it was really tough because it was always you know, uh, sad, sad, sad stories. And then we we'll tried to always um, put okay, let's try to do one feature a day and get one feature a day in the newscast, a good news story, a happy news story. Um, so uh, it could be a lot, but really, it's your time off when you're when you're looking for stories uh, at the end of the night when you're kind of done with the day or on the weekends uh that's when you're you're looking for original stories thank you felicia that's awesome and i also predict how felicia's brain works that even sitting here talking for the last hour and a half she's like generated like two stories in, in her brain <laughs> talia you're up um hi thank you hi. um my question's a little more general but it's um what's like the main advice that you have for new and journalists that are just starting out? I would say um, for a younger journalist just starting out, um, I would say a few things. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, it's not a typical job uh, being a journalist. I mean, you're not, it's not a, it's not a nine to five job. Um, so you need to be flexible. Um, I remember when I was freelancing, we were, I was doing weekends, morning show, um, lots of overtime, lots and lots of overtime. Um, and like I just mentioned, you're looking for stories on off hours. Um, so if you're starting off and you're lucky enough to maybe get into a station where you're freelancing, say yes to everything. And and you kind of have to roll with all the different hours and all the different um, uh, whatever they're gonna give you. So say yes to everything. That's the only way you're gonna get called back uh, to continue reporting um, and, and really be hungry. Go in uh, every day and even if, and pitch, and even if they don't maybe do that story that day, maybe there's gonna be a slow news day and they're gonna be like, oh yeah, remember? Uh, that story that you pitched Felicia, well, well we want to do it now. So just throw it out there all the time uh, to them. Um, and the way I also, I would say to young journalists to get into a station, uh, to get an internship, uh, just be a pain and bug them really like that's, that's what you have to do. Show that you're interested, show that you're hungry. I remember um, when I was at TSN 690, and I was chatting with um, the news director at CJD there, and they were telling me that if they get an email from a young journalist coming out of school for uh, an opportunity to work or uh, freelance or um, whatever it may be, uh, or an internship, they say that he would, he told me that he doesn't answer them until they email at least three times. <laughs> like that is really, it like that's what he had told me and I, I, I think it stuck with me for for a long time because I think I emailed uh, Karen at Global uh, my news director a lot of times to get that to, to get that job <laughs> and to get that to get in so uh, be hungry is definitely something that I would I would tell up and coming uh, aspiring journalists for sure. 
Our time is almost up, but I always have to end with Aphrodite. Aphrodite, you get the final quick question. <laughs> and then Felicia, you're free. And I want to thank everyone for being here. I'll do my thanks in a sec. But Aphrodite, last question. You're so sweet, Dave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia. This has been Hi. amazing. Hi. <laughs> you look great. Oh, my gosh. So I, I'll just ask. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> anyway, it's okay. Yeah. My question <laughs> is related to the what you were just saying about the pitching and all the rest of it. Um, one thing that students always ask me is how do how do they find story ideas? And I know what I tell them, but I'm curious to know what you would tell them. How do they find story ideas? I yeah. So I think I I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Of uh, of course, we're talking about this idea of social, like the Facebook being a part of the groups, um, local um, newspapers. A lot of local newspapers, we're often looking at the, the suburban, um, the off-island papers in Vaudreuil, uh, Le Journal, the, the Le Soleil, um, all these local newspapers where sometimes um, these, small, these small stories are not really uncovered by the, by the big you know, media. Um, and uh, I mean, at Global, we do a lot of these, you know, local stories we're always kind of in the community and like i had mentioned um building your your rolodex when you're when you're after you speak to one person keeping their numbers having them save yours maybe giving them your 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 contact information and you know encouraging them to reach out if they ever have a story idea and it comes in handy let me tell you i'm tell i i've gotten repeat um uh, people uh, come to me for different story ideas and I've interviewed them multiple times for different stories. So uh, it's great uh, that way in the sense. And I, I said this before too, I, I would be sometimes jealous of my veteran uh, older colleagues uh, in the beginning when I first started because they would always come to work and be like, oh, I'm going to do this story with so-and-so. And I was like, well, how did you find out about that? And it's just really <laughs> keeping that you know, keeping your contacts, uh, keeping in contact with them, checking in every now and then if, you know, they're, uh, if they had an issue and you spoke to them, well, not giving up on the story, you know, so recalling them back in a month. Hey, how's it going now? Are you still experiencing, you know, what we spoke about last month? Um, uh, maybe yes. And maybe there's a follow to it. You know, maybe there's a story there. So yeah, I would say all of those ways is how I, uh, still get stories uh, today. And, and even though I do all those things, my assignment editor is always saying, can you just, can you pitch something today? Can you pitch more? Da, da, da. They always, it's always wanted. So uh, no idea is silly. Um, every idea is, uh, you know, is taken, especially uh, with, with us. I think like we'll, like I mentioned, if it's not for today, maybe it's for tomorrow, maybe it's for next week, you know? So uh, for sure, uh, those are the ways I mainly look for stories. Thank you. No problem. Unless you're on the uh, behalf of the department, because I know we're three minutes over, I want to thank you. But I also want to give you, I'm going to give you the clap. But I also want thank to you so uh, know if there's anything you want to say, uh, like rounding out um, anything to everyone here. I also want to thank everyone here. I know how much we've been on Zoom for the last three months. So I really appreciate it. And actually seeing some smiles is good too. So Felicia, you've done a good job. Because most of the time in class these days with me, it's like, <laughs> no, no, not, it's not exactly true, but I, I like that there's there's always passion here. There's always things to do. So I was wondering if you could just round us up, Felicia, or take home and, and we'll call it. Yes, sure. So um, first of all, I think David mentioned to me, Dave mentioned to me before that you guys, some of you may be, you know, in your finals, maybe you're graduating, maybe you're, you know, just super stressed um about entering the workforce if you are graduating whatever your situation may be i would say just um i tell this to my little sister all the time because she's in jmsb and she's in her last semester um you know keep going you're gonna be fine take a breath um you know stay positive um think of what you want you'll attract it, be hungry, go after it kind of thing. I, I tell her this every day. I don't know if she listens to me or not. Uh, we'll see in a few, in a few weeks when she's done. Uh, and I tell her all the time to just, uh, you know, don't, str don't stress so much, but I was, I was a big stressor. I was a little nervous about entering the uh, workforce, but for all the young aspiring journalists out there, I will leave my email address in the chat if you'd like. And if you want to ask any 
questions that maybe you're too shy to ask now. I know that sometimes in class, I wasn't a big raise up my hand and whatever. I preferred one-on-ones really. Um, so I'll leave my, um, my email address. Uh, but what I would say is I repeat what I said before. If you want something, go after it and you're not annoying. Email the, the people until you get an answer. Um, and, uh, and, uh, we need young journalists. We need more journalists. So it, it's such an important thing, local journalism. And, um, sometimes it could be discouraging with, you know, maybe cuts or it, it, that you hear that happens sometimes, but, um, local journalism, I think will always be around, um, uh, in what format nobody knows we have yet to see we have yet to kind of discover but we'll always need young journalists and local journalists so um keep at it and yeah i'll, I'll leave my email and if everyone anyone wants to reach out feel free um i'm off for the next couple of days so i uh I, my my emails come to my phone so don't worry about it i'll answer you and if you have any other questions feel free and thank you, David. Thank, thank you. So you. Much. You're the best. This is amazing. And thank you for everyone for coming. I'm going to call it there. Um, you can